Hello everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and this evening, or the day, wherever you are in the world, I am doing an Ask Me Anything for the launch of my new book, How to Write Non-Fiction, which is out now in ebook print, coming soon in audiobook. And this evening, uh, I'm going to be answering your questions on whatever you like. I've promised an Ask Me Anything. And basically, I, I will answer anything on writing self-publishing, book marketing, or making a living with your writing. So we don't have to just be focused on the uh, non-fiction, although of course that would be awesome. So just uh, how this works is you get to type your question into the comments under the video, and then I should be um, seeing them. And in fact, I am. Thank you, Alexandra, who has um, left a note here. And basically I will answer any questions live. So please uh, type them into the box and then I will answer them. I also have quite a, a large gin and tonic here this evening to celebrate the launch. And I do also have three copies of How to Write Nonfiction to give away. Just to be clear, here's the book. Uh, so I have three signed copies that I'm going to give away this evening to the best questions. So think of some good questions to ask and I will be um, drawing those later and getting them in the post. So um, welcome to everyone who's joined me and yeah, please do add questions in the right hand side thank you Linda cheers um I hope those people who are it sort of outside or, or around me in the UK and further on have all got a drink <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to start by um, just briefly talking a bit about the launch uh, because this will be relevant to you however you publish, whatever genre, whether it's fiction or non-fiction. Because, uh, you know, I've obviously been writing and launching books now for a number of years and this is basically what I've done um, to launch How to Write Non-Fiction. I thought that might be a good way to start while we warm up with the questions and starting to see some comments now, which is great. Kitty says, your book showed up on my Kindle today. Hooray! Yes, thanks Kitty and everybody who's left a comment there. Julie's put a question, which I'll come back to. Um, but just to start on the launch, and I've written some notes just so I will actually get to it. But basically, I had two main points with launching a book um, at this point in my career, and I hope it will help you too. The first one is organizing everything in advance. Now, I think as indies, you know, we sometimes get this idea that we finish a book, get it edited, obviously, and then upload it and it's all done. But what I've done with this launch is try and get everything much more organized and try and make it so that I have a lot of stuff going on at the same time. So it's just a slightly annoying that my audiobook is not available, but it's in the ACX queue. It's the only thing that doesn't arrive when you want it to, obviously. <laughs> But this time I've done um, the ebook. I finished a month ago and I held my nerve. I had some patience. And while I got the print book done, and then I got a large print done, and we can come back to that if anyone's interested, and also a workbook edition, which I definitely think if you write nonfiction, doing a workbook edition is a great idea. Then, in terms of everything I got ready, oh, and I just saw. <laughs> question here uh, from Cariad. How many G&Ts are you on already? Okay, I have literally only just started my first G&T. It is quite a large one, but I thought I'd better not start too early. So this is just me being nervous. <laughs> Um, okay, so in terms of what I organized in advance, I had the ebook on pre-order. Um, and pre-orders, I know, are a little bit uh, pros and cons for indies in terms of ranking. But this is my second big point, is this is a long-term thing. And even though I'm doing this tonight, day of launch and everything, and I haven't even checked my ranking yet, um, often with the UK, the rankings are delayed because of American sales. So I, it, I, I might rank in the middle of the night. So please check if you're in uh, the US or Canada. Uh, but basically I set up the pre-orders and I also scheduled most of my marketing in advance. So I scheduled, just checking my list, um, I scheduled my Facebook advertising, I scheduled my BookBub ads, I recorded a video on YouTube which I scheduled, I um, scheduled my email blast, I scheduled this but I'm actually me, this is me live. <laughs> <laughs> um, I yeah so basically I scheduled loads of stuff and so I had time to get it all right 
because you know you just don't know what's going to happen on the day of launch so if you have it already that really helps um, if I was starting out I would have organized guest posts and podcasts but as I have my own blog and my own podcast I just put a blog post up I sent an email and I've been talking about it on the podcast for a while now so content marketing remains the cornerstone of my nonfiction marketing and again we can come back to oh Joyce says the book is a bestseller in the US oh that's cool thank you so much um, okay, so those are some of the thoughts that I, well, those are some of the things I'm doing for this launch. But as I said, the main thing really for me is the understanding that nonfiction books and fiction books, I mean, all of them, uh, remain the point is to make steady money over time so this is an evergreen book this should not need updating there is some stuff on marketing but I'm kind of hoping that that will stand the test of time for a bit so um, that's a bit of what I'm doing on the launch and of course you can uh, ask more questions oh I just saw John a, a Hoda hi John and welcome to the course I saw you joined the course earlier so brilliant okay and of course we can talk about doing multimedia courses as well if you like so so I'm here for you this evening, so you can just uh, ask me anything. Right, I'm going to start with Julie's question because she got in first after I have a bit more gin. <laughs> and yes, it's a very large glass. <laughs> okay, so Julie says, I'm really interested in how to get the personal touch into your book when it's on a technical subject. And Julie writes about school funding. I'm finding it quite difficult. This is a great question. And I'm actually, I think Julie's gonna get the first giveaway. We're gonna start early with the giveaway. So Julie Cordona gets the first print giveaway signed book because this is the whole point. Actually, this is a brilliant question because a few months, I started writing this, I think in February after I wrote my last script. Um, and then I started writing it. I was like, I know people want this. People have been asking for it for ages. And then I got really bored. I got bored with my own book. And I just got to the point of, of thinking, do we really need another book on writing nonfiction? I mean, seriously, I was tired and I was reading quite a lot of other people's. And like you say, I was like, how do I make this personal? This is a how-to book, as many of mine are, but how do I bring this alive? And that's the question. I don't want to see any more non story-based non-fiction books like let's stop with a prescriptive just how to and that was when I went back to my journals again and um, I have a lot of journals and I started going through my journals trying to figure out what has changed my life in terms of non-fiction what are the moments in my life where I've read a book and it has made me you know things have changed and there have been quite a few <laughs> But in the book, I share some personal moments. And Julie, this is the answer to your question. You need to look at your life and then put your own stories into the book. And this is true whether or not it's memoir. So of course, if it's memoir, it's going to be your story. But if it's a more prescriptive nonfiction, and I have a few oh, up there, <laughs> you can see, uh, even things like The Healthy Writer that I co-wrote with Dr. Ewan Lawson, it was my personal chapter on D dealing with sugar addiction <laughs> uh, and how I wrote a letter to sugar, that chapter has had more questions than a lot of the medical studies stuff. So we can touch other people with our personal stories if we go to the heart and we try and tap into emotion. So what you have to think about, Julie, and everybody listening is, why do you care about this topic so much that you want to write a book on it? It's not, I mean, yes, it might add some money into your income streams, but it has to be more than that. There has to be heart in it. And that's why in How to Write Nonfiction, I spend the whole of the first part of the book talking about this, really, about how you have to go deep. You have to feel nervous. Like, I feel nervous about this, this book release, more nervous than I felt about The Healthy Writer, because I feel like my heart is on the page and I want it to help people. So that's the answer to that question and loads of other um, questions around that I think so basically get to the heart of things and that's true in fiction you know writing emotion and tapping into your emotion and other people's emotion is so important okay so um oh thanks Andy says I, I respect your decision to share your personal journey too thank you so much I've been my fear of judgment has been on overdrive um okay so Kate says is your new book geared for non-fiction writers of all topics or more for non-fiction about writing 
oh, Kate, it's definitely not about writing a book about writing. It's writing a nonfiction book on any topic. And you can probably see, oh, look, oh, I keep getting the wrong side. <laughs> There we go. Career Change, the first book I wrote um, back in 2008 uh, about how if you really hate your job, how do you work out what you want to do with your life? And that's the model really for my nonfiction books, that transformation. Uh, and that's a really important point too. The, how do you want the arc of the reader to go? What do you want to change in their life? And so absolutely the book is for nonfiction on any topic. Um, I would say it's not for academic textbooks, definitely not. There are very clear ways that you have to write textbooks. So anything, if it's not a textbook, should be fine. Uh, oh, Jason says, loving, loving the book. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, Oh, Jamie says, I'm glad my calendar announced this was on. Excellent, that worked. Linda says, love workbooks. I love workbooks too. It's amazing how many of them sell. And many of you know I've had a bit of a conversion experience around print and with all the news recently about KDP and, uh, you know, KU and things like that, I think having a healthy print sales are actually brilliant because they sell on so many platforms around the world, especially if you use Ingram Spark to go wide. And uh, I just, I'm amazing how those print sales really grow when you add on multiple streams of income. Okay, Kelly says, or Kelly Lee says, pen name for nonfiction. First time I've seen this. Oh, okay, so no, I mean, Joanna Penn is is my real name, <laughs> and JF Penn is my thriller name, and I use, also use Penny Appleton for the sweet romance I co-write with my mom, which is very cool. So um, the, the one of the main reasons I use multiple names is to segregate my brand on Amazon and the other stores so that the algorithms can learn the genre that people that my readers like so many of you will read my non-fiction but you're not interested in my thrillers or my dark fantasy so our uh, also bots don't get mixed up and I go through this very much in the book I think this is key there are some authors who say it's not a problem but I think with big data and the increase in the way algorithms are driving sales that being able to clearly segregate also bots works very well and the and a, a little tip there if you're doing amazon ads and you have very clear also bots the automatic amazon ads work quite well whereas they don't really work for my fiction because i write crime dark fantasy action adventure bit of horror so that's a bit mixed okay do I have, Andy says, do you have a particular app or software to help you schedule and multitask? Okay, where is it? Here it is. I have an iPhone. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I use um, the Google Calendar. I'm just a Google Calendar freak these days. Um, I schedule all kinds of things. I even schedule like that. Today I had um, the, the time things would go out and so I could monitor those uh, over time. I have personal stuff, like I do actually send my husband, Jonathan, invites to, you know, dinner with, you know, my parents or different things like that. Not our dinner at home. <laughs> But I, shed, I do schedule um, a lot, and I think that's the secret to getting things done. However, I don't think I multitask as such. I will schedule and do a single task in that period. So I've been really focused on this book over the last couple of months, and I haven't written any fiction. I've been plotting, plotting my time, not actually plotting the book, but um, I'm actually off to Spain next week to Madrid to finish the research on the next arcane novel. So I've planned that time in my diary so that I would have that um, after this finished. Oh, Jason says it's a number one bestseller on Amazon. Awesome. <laughs> Please, somebody take some screen prints. Well, it will probably still be there when I um, get off the call. Uh, oh, actually, Alexandra, my VA, she can take some screen prints. Oh, look, people are saying it's a number one in authorship. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, thanks for the reviews. Right. Harley says, I'm just going to take another sip. And I'm only holding it with both hands because it's a very nice glass and I don't want to drop it live on Facebook. Um, okay. 
Harley says, as a fiction author, I spend my time developing characters and plots. I've considered writing nonfiction, but struggle with the idea of putting a story on the page in a nonfictional way, sifting through my real life stuff. Does this, this perhaps this boils down to a shift in mindset, but I'm coming, struggling to come up with a nonfiction idea that warrants writing. Well, there's a good point right there. A nonfiction idea that warrants writing. That's hilarious because with writing fiction, why do we feel that writing nonfiction or fiction warrants um, writing? Okay, they they serve different purposes. Okay, there are enough quest books in the world. We don't need another. Oh, we did it again. Map of Shadows. Uh, you know, there are enough books about writing nonfiction. I've written another one. This is the there are too many books in the world. Why should I write another one? Argument. And the reason we should write books is because we have something to express, something to share. We're going to entertain people. Uh, we're going to educate people, we're going to inspire people. So I think um, in terms of going off on a non-fiction tangent about something that will end up adding no value to the world, oh, I think that's so great, Harley, because I totally felt this way. And again, I addressed this right at the beginning of the book. And when I did a survey on how to write non-fiction a few months back, this was one of the top things. I'm, I'm an imposter. I'm, I'm not an expert. I don't, you know, there are too many books on this. And it really is everything we write can add value to the world, even if it's helping us first. Like, even if it helps nobody else, writing down our feelings and whatever we want to share helps us. So that is one reason to do it if there's things that are burning on your heart. The second thing is that um, as a professional author and wanting to add multiple streams of income, writing nonfiction in your niche, and it could be relate to your um, your niche. For example, I'm definitely <laughs> I'm definitely going to write some dark books. Um, I've got there. I, I've got ideas for nonfiction. I want to write under JF Pen that will lead people into my fiction. So that's probably what I will do. In fact, the shadow book, which I've talked about a lot, the writing from the dark side that I will be doing at some point. Uh, that book, I I may even publish that under JF Pen. Not sure yet, but we'll see how that goes. So I hope that helps. Basically, um, you know, really just every, everything will add value to the, to the world. Okay. Oh, Liz says, how do you use story principles in nonfiction to keep readers turning the page? Well, one is, is um, character. So this is really important. This comes back to what I said earlier about um, what Julie's thing was, which is you are the character in your nonfiction book. So you have to, as in a novel, you would say, okay, this character has this character arc. In the nonfiction book, you are showing your character through your author's voice, through the way you speak. And I hope those of you who've got the book um, or any of my nonfiction books know that this is how I write as well as this is how I talk. So there's no screen or or anything in between us when I, I write my nonfiction. So character is one thing, yourself as a character on the page showing your voice. And secondly, the reader as character following an arc. So obviously how to write nonfiction <laughs> uh, is about taking you from someone who hasn't written a nonfiction book or maybe has and it hasn't been that successful to someone who has finished a nonfiction book. And so that is the arc of the reader journey. So those are one thing. Also, uh, telling, uh, showing, not telling. <coughs> speaking too fast. So in the, in the book, I tell uh, or show a few stories, one particular one in Bali. And instead of saying, I went to Bali and this happened, I actually say, you know, Bali 20, 2008 or whenever it was. And then I actually write it as if it was a scene in, in a novel, although it was true. So actually bringing stuff alive is, is the way forwards. Oh, Linda says, OMG, me too. I'm getting bored with my own nonfiction. <laughs> And when you start to feel like that, then the reader's going to be bored. So you have to do something to bring it alive. And I think it's that edge of fear that will bring it alive. Now, that might be a little scary, but there's a quote from Neil Gaiman in the book. And it's something like, when you feel that you're walking around in the middle of the road naked with your writing, that's when you've got it right. When you're scared to put it out there because you've shared your soul, that's, that's the way forward. So if you're bored, scare yourself. <laughs> Uh, Melanie says, oh, this is a good question. Uh, in fact, Melanie Notaris gets the next print giveaway. Um, so thanks, Alexandra, for writing that down. And Melanie, please email me later. So 
question says, I'm wondering whether I should read or research other people's books first, or will I lose my author voice? Should I read them after? Great question, and one that I get I get emails about this almost every day. Should I read other people's books? And again, this is true whether you write fiction or non-fiction. Personally, this is an opinion, I guess, but I think you should read as much as you can in the genre you're writing. Um, whether that's fiction, like I just, just before I was having a bit of a rest and I'm reading a, a horror novel by Graham Masterton and I love reading dark books and it helps really informs my fiction. And for nonfiction, I absolutely believe you should go deep in your genre because how else are you going to write something different? How are you going to find your voice and find something original unless you look at what's already there. Otherwise, you put the book out and then go, oh, crap, someone's already written that. So I think you should definitely read uh, as much as possible in every genre. And thus, we are a self-sustaining industry, which is very cool. And this is why I think everyone in the world should be writing books all the time, because we'll, then we'll buy more and it'll just grow and grow. Ah, world domination. But anyway, yes, I definitely think you should be reading other people's books. Take notes. And also, if you'll, you'll see with all my nonfiction books, I quote authors all the time and I have a bibliography and I'm always referring people to other people's books. And that's the way to do it. OK. What aspects of nonfiction do you cover? Memoir, travel writing, do you focus on the craft of writing? Okay, so the point is with the book, thank you for asking about the book, Andrew. Uh, so the point is with the book, the principles of writing nonfiction relate to all genres, in my opinion, except for the academic stuff. So for example, there's a, uh, one chapter is on truth and how true is nonfiction? And I think this is a fascinating question because if you're writing memoir, then shouldn't it be the truth of your life? But is there any actual truth? Or if you're writing a book about religion or if you're book writing a book about politics, <laughs> what is the truth anyway? Or if you're writing a history book about a medieval saint, how do you know some of that is truth? So I would say um, actually that uh, it's, uh, sorry, Andrew, I've just lost your your comments um, but basically that the book is relevant for whatever genre you're writing within the non-fiction space or if you're thinking of writing a book okay my comments have just gone completely nuts I was uh, scrolling down in a very organized fashion and now it's all disappeared so I'm just gonna I might have to jump around a bit sorry <laughs> if I miss your question please just add it again and hopefully I'll I'll get to it uh, okay uh, when will you release on audiobook? Thanks, Zia. Uh, yes, so I have uploaded the book to ACX, but it takes a while to come through. So um, that's one thing you can't control, unfortunately. So hopefully it will be in the next week or two. Uh, okay, focus on the arc of the reader. Molly likes that. Does the multimedia course include things that are not in the book? Okay, George, thanks for that question. So the multimedia course, I take the chapters of the book and then I do a presentation like this around each chapter. So I'm not re it's not an audiobook version. It's a video course like this with slides and some extras. But ma the main thing is that I'm talking like this. Now, inevitably, when I'm presenting slides, I actually end up extemporizing on things. So you're never going to get exactly what's in the book. You're going to get extra stuff and me talking about bits and bobs as I go through and personal experiences and stuff that you know I'm happy to share within that course space. So it definitely does include things that are not in the book. Um, and uh, of course, the multimedia course has a 30 day uh, money back guarantee. So you're welcome to uh, try it out. And if you go to the creative pen and hit the course button, you'll see it there along with my other courses. Anthony St. Clair, hi Anthony, says, how much do you come into nonfiction from having a predefined sense of what you want to write versus using the blog and the podcast to see what the audience responds to? Okay, um, with that, 
with this book, um, I guess I've been working backwards in my journey and that I, one of the first books, nonfiction books I wrote for writers was how to market a book, mainly because I was figuring it out for myself. And Business for Authors, for example, that's one of the books that I wrote um, when I just moved into full-time business as an author. So I tend to write books when I want to learn about things, when I want to embed my knowledge. And with the nonfiction, it was something that I've been thinking about for a long time and I felt just ready. I think The Healthy Writer probably released quite a lot of things for me because I've definitely started to share a lot more personal stuff. Um, maybe it just takes us a long time to find our groove, but there were some things I was ready to talk about with the nonfiction book that I haven't really talked about before. So I think in a way, the book, um, <laughs> I'm going to do it again, <laughs> The Successful Author Mindset, that book came from a blog post. So I wrote a blog post on the roller coaster of uh, being an, an author. So the I love writing. It's the best thing in the world. It's just amazing to, oh, I hate writing. It's so tiring. I'll never make any money. It's just, you know, that kind of um, roller coaster that we have. So uh, that was a blog post and it got so many shares and I got so many comments that I ended up writing the mindset book because of that blog post. Uh, so hopefully that answered that question. Uh, okay. Sorry, trying to drive the comments is <laughs> difficult. Um, oh, Kelly says, sorry, I should have been more clear. Can you use a pen name for nonfiction? Yes, absolutely. You can use a pen name whenever you like. Just be wary of using too many like me. I mean, it's a bit of a pain to do email lists, to do websites. I mean, you don't have to do all of that, um, but uh, it can definitely help with your branding and everything. So yeah, when you do a pen name, just to be clear, when you publish, when you self-publish, you can still have one account, so one bank account where your money goes, but you can add different author names so you don't need different accounts you also don't need different legal companies if you're running one um, so yeah doing and uh, doing different author names is absolutely cool I don't know why I can't I think because there's so many comments now so apologies if your comment disappears then please just do it again <laughs> Uh, when will you publish a fiction book? I miss Penny Appleton and JF Penn. Thanks, Jason. Well, actually, like Map of Shadows only came out just before Christmas. Um, and I know most fiction authors now write lots, but I actually personally don't write too many JF Penn a year. I think I only do usually one or two JF Penn books a year. So the next book will be an arcane novel. And then we will see. It will probably be the next one in the Map of Shadows series. Oh, and the next Penny Appleton is coming uh, probably next month. My mum's giving me the, oh no, probably August actually. So that'd be fun. And we've got a Christmas wedding book coming, which is going to be brilliant at Christmas. The f I mean, I used to not understand, well, I still don't really understand romance, but the Christmas wedding idea, I think it's just going to be fun. Uh, David says, and David Cadby, hello, David. David's coming on the podcast soon. Definitely have learned to write about the thing that I most want to instill in myself. That's totally true. I think we almost write nonfiction as uh, to get there ourselves and to figure out what we think about things. That's certainly this shadow book that may well take years to write <laughs> is because I'm trying to work out myself. How does this happy, positive, um, woman uh you know have a oh i've got my skull on my desk uh that i'll show you why does she have a skull on her desk here we go here's the sugar skull that i have on my desk so i have this memento mori thing going on you know remember we will die all the time and that's why i think that you should write a book that challenges you that challenges your readers and that is worth being in the world <laughs> Okay, so, oh, number one in Canada. Thanks for sharing that, Samantha. I really appreciate it. <laughs> uh, okay, Lisa says, isn't it easier to self-publish if you're not an expert? It seems to me that traditional publishers want only experts, um, which is uh, fantastic. Basically, the ex 
expert status. I do question the word expert in the book because what is an expert anyway? And, and what's hilarious, like, do you have to have 10 PhDs? Do you have to have 50 years experience? Um, you know, if you write a book about raising children and you've only had one child, is that enough? Do you need to have had five children? Or, you know, I think the word expert is difficult and potentially in this political environment, it is a hot potato, the word expert. But um, if you write a book and you research something that you're interested in, that you care about, then the book will help make you an expert. So, I mean, obviously don't write a medical book if you're not a doctor, <laughs> be sensible. But I assume none of you are going to do that. Uh, okay. Crystal says, how do I best write a memoir? I feel like aren't interested in them anymore. I, I wonder if that's, I feel like readers aren't interested or, um, anyway, the point is with a memoir, I had a, um, I think with memoir, you have to come up with a theme. So I've thought about writing a travel memoir. So I've got lots of notes on this, another one of my books in progress. Um, but basically I've traveled a lot in the world and I've written novels and things about my travels, but there have been places in the world where I've had, particularly spiritual experiences and just felt like that place has something about it where the veil is thin as I say in my novels and I want to write that as a memoir. Now that's a theme or a thread that goes through my life. I think the memoirs that are kind of boring <laughs> are the ones that are almost like biographies so they are this happened then this happened then this happened whereas a, a memoir that's transformational if you read something like wild by cheryl strade or eat pray love yay which i write about in how to write nonfiction. these are about transformations so i think the key with memoir as well as the rest of nonfiction, is personal transformation and to pick out the things that feed into that and i think to be honest i think all of this for nonfiction is about curation. It's about taking aspects of your research, your life, and curating them into your effective book that helps the reader. So hopefully that helps. Okay. Ah, looks like it's doing well. Thank you for sharing the rankings. <laughs> <laughs> a double number one bestseller on amazon.ca right alexandra take some screen breaks <laughs> um okay and right andrew says when you were starting out did you find yourself getting too focused on checking your sales and income numbers how have you dealt with this okay so remember when i started out when i self-published oh i'm so old uh when i self-published in 2007 2008 there was no Kindle, let alone the international Kindle, which came later. So when I self-published originally, it was print books in my garage. And then eventually I was able to self-publish through Smashwords. And then Kindle opened up to um, the world. And then there were hardly any sales on it anyway, because nobody knew about it. So when I started out, sales and ranking was very, very different. Um, it, there was nothing like the kind of hype that there is now. And there were not the tools that we have now. And there were not the number of authors. I mean, indie was indie had a massive stigma when I started. So why I think I've always been able to not really look at that is because I've always had a long term view. And that kind of goes back to what I was saying right at the beginning of this session, which is if you have a long-term view of your author business, then the individual launch day, like today, it's wonderful that um, the book is ranking because frankly, it would be embarrassing <laughs> since, I, since I wrote a, um, a book on how to market a book, it would be embarrassing if I couldn't hit some rankings. But it's not, it, my, my point is this book is, in I'm intending to sell this for many, many years and the course for many, many years. So I've never really had much of a short term focus. Now I have at different times. So when um, a number of us decided to hit the New York Times and then again, when I hit the USA Today on my own a couple of years ago, that was I am deciding to hit this goal. I am going to do this goal and then I will forget about it again. So I think it's very much about um, you know, deciding what's important to you, what your longer term goals are, and then fitting things around that. Okay, aha, 
I see the next book that I'm going to give away to Deborah Kobelski Robertson. So Deborah Kobelski Robertson, you have won a signed copy of How to Write Nonfiction because your question, what if you want to share a story about a person, but you don't want that person to know it is them? <laughs> So the reason I'm rewarding this question is because, again, this is one of the top questions that I get asked again almost every day and sits in the book, you know, near the top because it's so common. And in fact, these kind of legal questions and this can be a legal question are really important. So basically, you have a couple of choices. One, and I quote from Mary Carr who has a brilliant book, The Art of Memoir, and she says something like, if you want revenge, get a lawyer. <laughs> Do not use your writing as any kind of revenge. But if you have a story about a person and you want to hide it, it's a bit, you know, you do have to get rid of any distinguishing things and that can be very difficult. And this is why I have the chapter on truth because how can you write non-fiction and make it true but still kind of make it up? And that's often called narrative non-fiction, which has got that side of memoir. So what you need to basically do is fictionalize it in some way um, and then essentially, uh, you know, hide them. Uh, so either don't use them entirely or hide them in some way and really make sure that um, they can't recognize themselves. So changing their physical appearance, changing their gender can be a smart one, changing where they live, changing whatever um, that makes it still your truth, but doesn't uh, blow up your family situation, unless you want to blow up your family situation, which is what Mary Carr talks about in The Art of Memoir. Okay, again, I'm so sorry about not, I can't seem to scroll back through these comments very easily. Uh, okay. Right. That's one massive G and T, Gary says. As I mentioned, it's more a big glass without, I should have got a smaller glass and then it would look more normal. I'm actually almost finished. Okay. Uh, besides writing a book, what are some other ways to build authority and a non-fiction platform in your niche? Great question. And my love, love, love is for content marketing. Now, hopefully you've noticed this because of the podcast, which is up to like 370 odd episodes now. Um, blogging, I still believe in blogging. It's still the best SEO in your market. So if you do a podcast, use a transcript. And I talk a lot about transcripts and dictation and things in the book. But the I, I kid you not, the transcripts on the creative pen bring traffic to the site every day. So, um, you know, basically by having keywords around your niche in nonfiction, you can develop an authority website. Um, you can have a YouTube channel. So I have a YouTube channel, but again, everything goes on the blog with a transcript so that I embed the video and I still have the article. Uh, so everything with, if you think about SEO, search engine optimization, what's so fascinating about my business, well, what's become fascinating to me, obviously, is that since 2015, pretty much, um, SEO and uh, organic search. So I don't pay for traffic to the creative pen unless I have a short term launch like this or a webinar. But the traffic, um, which is now over uh, half a million uniques a month, is mostly organic search, like it's 99.99 organic search. Um, so that's, that's pretty amazing. And that comes from years of posting content. So to me, the way of developing authority is to choose your niche, and then to write about it, podcast, video, whatever you like to do. And you could do Facebook Live. Um, and But in fact, if you do Facebook Live like this, I'm going to take this video, put it on YouTube, do a blog post with show notes, which Alexandra is doing, um, and basically, and maybe even put this audio on the podcast. So I'll be using this content in multiple ways. And this is what I'm also hoping to do with my um, my fiction platform uh, over time is basically start writing, start developing authority around the topics I write about. So that's a thought. Uh, Rachel says, I was in the middle of a long question and you answered it while I typed. You read my brain. <laughs> Thank you. And I think what's so great about writing in a niche that you love and that you're passionate about is you do read people's brains because it's your brain. I mean, you literally have the same brain and the same questions and the same thoughts. 
Um, Joe says, do you do book tours? Please say yes. No, I don't. <laughs> this introvert struggles with just doing Facebook Live. I mean, book tours are a nightmare. I am speaking a couple of times um, this year now uh, in Philadelphia for the Book Baby um, Conference because I want to go to Washington DC and also the Mutter Museum in Philadelphia. Those who like body parts will enjoy, oh look, I did it again, desecration. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also I'm at Nink, Novelists Inc. in Florida, so that should be fun too. Uh, okay, Karen says, have you used Ingram Spark for your print and did you do the layout with vellum? Okay, so I do, um, I actually use uh, a wonderful formatter, the same wonderful designer, Jane Dixon Smith, JD Smith Design, who does my covers for all my books now, also does my interior formatting. And um, non-fiction formatting is actually a really big deal. Um, it is much more in-depth than fiction formatting. So I do my own formats really for fiction, but for print, oh, I do my own ebook formatting on vellum and there is a vellum tutorial if you're interested um, you can if you go to thecreativepen.com forward slash formatting you'll find a video tutorial on vellum which is fantastic but um, I use I, I use Jane to do all my print design interior design and she did also the companion workbook and also the large print edition. So yes, I do use Ingram Spark, but I don't use Vellum for print formatting. Oh, actually, I do it for the success, successful self-publishing book. Uh, I have. Um, I did that on Vellum. So yeah. Uh, Linda said, do you like to add more content in the workbook version? Is it simply providing writing space? Okay, Linda, thanks for that question. I actually, for the mindset book, I left... The content in and added questions for this book this is actually a chunky book um it's it's pretty chunky this is not a small book this is this is kind of seventy thousand words this is another one magnum opus um work um so the the workbook edition is hasn't got the content it's just got the questions and some sort of introductory comments uh right Annie Lynn says, over the last couple of years, I probably wrote over 250,000 words, but I don't know how to organize it. I study, I study everything, but it's not clicking. Okay, so if you have 250,000 words in writing, um, and actually this question applies to any kind of organization, and that is something I definitely cover. If you are researching a nonfiction book, uh, you need a way to collate your research. Now, I use uh, Scrivener. So Scrivener is my organization tool for both fiction and nonfiction, and I also use it for writing in. So when I come up with an idea, so like the shadow book, which has been a Scrivener project now for a while, I just dump ideas, research, links, one-liners, uh, quotes, I just dump all of that into a Scrivener project. I also use Evernote as a sort of place to save um, URLs, links when I'm finding them, when I'm on the internet, I save links that way. Um, I also use Things, oh, I should have mentioned that earlier, I use Things app as a to-do app. Um, so if there's something I want to follow up, I will look on there. Uh, but basically, I, I use Scrivener, that is how I organize and with my fiction, I will then, so say I'm writing, so I'm in Madrid next week, uh, doing, looking at, um, and going to Toledo, which will link into um, New Orleans and San Francisco. I shan't tell you how, it will be a surprise. Uh, but basically, I'm going to find that out, and then I will add my research for Madrid and Toledo into the Scrivener document, and then I will split the pane, and I'll write the the chapter or write notes into the document for the actual chapter while still viewing the research. I also take a lot of pictures um, to help, and then I, when I write descriptions of buildings and stuff, I'll, I'll look at my pictures. Okay. So Kitty, I think I've answered that about the workbook. So it's basically no, not the entire text, it's, it's the questions. So every chapter in How to Write Nonfiction has a load of questions at the end of the chapter. So for example, that chapter on truth, I discuss the meaning of truth. And then the question is, what do you consider truth for your book and how are you gonna tackle that? So it's just a way, oh, and then I have a whole section on the business. We haven't even really talked about money this evening, but um, a whole section on the business side and positioning your book in the market. And that, um, that has a lot of space for answering the questions. 
Oh, Linda says, thank you, Linda. Totally recommend any and all of Joanna's courses. I'm learning so much. It's almost like having an on-demand coach. Thank you so much, Linda. I might steal that for a testimonial. <laughs> And of course, we have private Facebook groups um, for all the courses, and uh, I'm in there. That is where I am at. Uh, okay, what is a suitable length for a non-fiction book? Jim Tramontana, you get a signed print copy of How to Write Nonfiction. Great question, and just again it's so brilliant when people ask the questions that I prepared in advance <laughs> so Jim Tramontana please do um let us know your email so anyone that I've given a book to um email joanna at the creative pen.com and we will sort you out um but yes what is a suitable length for a non-fiction book well the answer is whatever it will be. But no, that's a bad answer. So basically, you need to decide what your book is. And this is where I talk a lot about speed and quality. And the word quality is just a classic one in the publishing world and the indie space, to be fair. So I could have written, I thought I was going to write a short book. I thought I was going to do something that was quick and simple and would serve my audience, you guys, but would be you know, pretty prescriptive. And then what happened is it turned into something a lot more and that will happen. So, but absolutely. So successful self-publishing, <laughs> oh, which is up there somewhere. Um, that is a very short ebook. It's 20,000 words. It is useful. Uh, it's a free ebook. So you can, and the point of me writing that was because every day I get questions, which are, how do I self-publish a book? And I'm like, well, you could read my blog or you could get this free ebook um, on any platform. So it was really so I could answer a lot of repetitive questions with a book. Um, amazingly, it sells in print. I didn't think it would, but it does. Um, but that book is very short, 20,000, 25,000 words, useful to the customer. And, you know, it makes some money. Someone like Steve Scott, uh, SJ Scott, writes short, useful books and writes lots of them and sells them for 2.99 US dollars and Steve makes a very good income. So you can definitely write short, useful, whatever books in a niche and you can do fine. But you might want to, maybe you're a speaker or maybe you want to, um, like me, maybe you want to go deeper into it and then the book will be longer. So as I said, this is around 70,000. Um, how to market a book is also around 65,000. Business for authors is 65,000. And then books like How to Make a Living with Your Writing, that is again another short book. It didn't take me very long to write. And hilariously, that's the book that makes um, the most money in my nonfiction space. So completely up to you. And similarly with fiction, it will depend on what you want to write, a novella, short book or a longer book. And it also will depend on your genre. OK. Right. <laughs> I'm just lost in the comments now. OK, we've got 15 minutes left. Uh, okay, I'm just going to scroll down. This Linda says this is a virtual book tour. It kind of is, I suppose. I maybe I need a drink from every <laughs> time zone or something. Um, Rachel says you mention being an introvert all the time, but you do brilliantly in your videos and podcasts. Thanks for overcoming all of that for us. Thank you, and the gin helps. <laughs> and also, you know, it's so funny because I dread these things. I I I worry for hours beforehand that I'm going to say something bad or something bad will happen. And then when I do it and I see you guys and your comments and I realize that I could do this more often um, and it would be fine and hopefully helpful. Um, okay, anyway, thank you. <laughs> uh, Dave says, what are the differences between formatting for fiction and nonfiction? Okay, so basically if you look at a novel, it's just chapters of plain text in you know with chapter one plain text chapter two plain text there might be some ornamental breaks between scenes but that's it whereas non-fiction you're going to be using a lot of subheadings that's really important so um subheadings quotes maybe tables bullet points all of that type of thing that and if you're writing something that has um 
yeah tables or anything more technical the print version will have those and this is actually a really good point that I definitely want to mention for nonfiction if you have um, images tables anything that is um, might inflate the file size that will that potentially will impact your delivery charges on Amazon which will cut into your royalties so definitely watch that and I don't think you need images in your nonfiction ebooks and this is another good point we're getting onto lots of good points here um, you will redo the content of your book per format so I do the ebook first then I do the print book and for the print book I take out all the hyperlinks obviously and turn them into easily typeable links so if you have the print book you'll see you know in there there will be thecreativepen.com forward slash vellum for example that's my affiliate link to vellum software and so instead of using the really long affiliate link I use the uh, plugin pretty links to create easy URLs and then for the audiobook I remove things like um, lots of bullet points are difficult to read aloud um, again too many URLs sound weird in a in an audiobook there are some things like the word read that you could change to listen um, so basically you will adjust your uh, content depending on the format that you're producing uh, John asks how did you validate that there would be a readership and course attendees for this did you use surveys so yes I did a survey but basically I knew that my audience would be interested in a book on nonfiction. it's something that I get asked about a lot so if you have an audience already you can ask them and I did a survey after I just I did start doing the book before I did the survey and then when I got bored with it, I decided to ask the audience, you guys, um, what I should do. And that's how I came up with different chapters and things like the truth chapter. I didn't really think about that. And then it became an interesting um, point. Uh, so if you don't have a readership already, the best thing to do is to research on Amazon or whichever store you're interested in selling on. And also look at keywords, look at blogs, um, popular blogs in the niche, look at podcasts, look at what's doing well and think about why is that doing well and how could you uh, tap into that and make sure it overlaps with your, um, your interest. Uh, One, wondering about some of the pricing. So Jules says, wondering about pricing for nonfiction. Some of them seem amazing value, but authors not charging much. Is there a perception of value which might mean prices could be higher? Great question. And that relates to the earlier point around length. So what you will find is that the shorter books are cheaper. So if you're right, like my 25,000 word books, they are cheaper. This book, uh, I think this is like $7.99 because I'm not discounting this this is a good book I'm sorry to say it myself but I've put a lot into this so I'm not discounting it and non-fiction holds higher prices than fiction um, because I think non-fiction non-fiction readers expect to get value from a book so they are more happy to pay for it and if they like when I buy a non-fiction book and I'll pay sometimes 15 bucks for a Kindle non-fiction book and uh, I will expect to find one or two or ten things that I can highlight and that will help me and if I get that I'm, I'm satisfied to pay a higher price. And sometimes I have pages and pages and pages of notes, which I hope you'll have with my book, obviously. Uh, uh, Jason says, how do you manage to write with your mother without cringing, laughing, or wanting to yell at her? <laughs> Love Penny Apperson. Well, it's interesting you say that because I was saying to my husband, Jonathan, the other day, who's been working with me now for three years. And of course, I, this is the fourth book with my mum. I've helped my dad write a book. And basically, a lot of the time you do want to kill the other person. <laughs> But you have to look at the bigger picture and my mum is brilliant. She absolutely respects my authority in the publishing space and basically and realizes how good she has it. My mum has the dream life. She just gets to write and I do the rest. I do all the publishing and the marketing. So she literally has a dream life. <laughs> uh, okay. Um Right, we are almost towards the end. Oh, Julie says, please do these Facebook Live more often. 
<laughs> but it kills me, Julie. It kills me. <laughs> um, okay. How many sales for your first nonfiction book would you call a success? I launched my first in March and it's only sold 500 to date from Gary. Gary, 500 is brilliant. The, the statistics for books is something like most books only sell like 500 copies and up to maybe 5,000 in the lifetime. So you're doing really brilliantly. So that's lovely. Molly says, I can't get enough, Joanna Penn. Thank you. Um, I'll gladly support your efforts in a Facebook Live with or without gin and tonic. I'm not sure I can do it without. <laughs> what about trilogy nonfiction? Um, yes, I actually, I did a box set for nonfiction a while back, and then I decided to pull it because I actually update my files quite a lot for nonfiction, so it just became a bit of a pain, so I stopped doing that. Um, but yes, definitely you can pick a, I mean, I essentially have a series that way. <laughs> I have a series on um, of, on writing for writers, so yeah, you can definitely do that. Uh, Siobhan says, love the podcast, thank you, and uh, reading How to Market a Book on Kindle, brilliant. Oh, Linda says, this book could be $9.99, just saying. I think if you get the print one, it is like $9.99. <laughs> um, okay, oh, right, Nikki is also asking about the writer trilogy advice for nonfiction. Okay, so um, just to go further into that, uh, the successful self-publishing is actually my lead gen, my perma-free lead gen into the bigger series for authors. So the idea being that most people are looking for self-publishing books all the time, well, most people in the writing space. And so I get a lot of downloads on that, but then it leads into other books. So you can definitely do similar ideas to the fiction space for sure. Oh, everyone's saying I should do more of these. That's very sweet of you. I definitely, I'm, I will consider it. I, I think I would need to do it at different time zones as well. Um, okay. Zia asked, do you tailor for your market as you go? How much does it dictate your direction? Great question. And to be honest, I, I gave up my job that I hated because I hated every day. And that was because I had no control. And this is part of what being in India is, you know, the, the control side. And so I don't let anyone determine my direction. So, for example, how to write a novel. I know there'll be a book on that eventually. But again, not yet. That is not something I'm doing because my direction is now back on the fiction. I am so desperate to write a novel. <laughs> I feel like, please, can I write some fiction? And I just can't seem to do both at the same time. Uh, OK. Janet says, I love the podcast. This is great too. Hate to see it end. Well, I will, I'm sure I will be back. Donna says, do you feel the same with this launch as with your first book? That's a good question. Do you know what? I had no clue, zero clue with that first book. I literally, it, it kind of makes me weep to look back at myself now. But again, remember it was in a time before Kindle, before global self-publishing, I was in Australia, I, I knew nothing. So I had boxes, th thousands of books that I printed and they were in our um, lounge. And I thought that I would sell them all and make a million. <laughs> I really did, I was that person. And then I didn't, I discovered that you have to learn about marketing as an author and that started my journey. And then things started to change in the scene and so, the difference, of course, is that back then there was nobody. Uh, there, there really was nobody. So I made so many mistakes that first year, but there was no one to see them. And that's there's this this thing with when you do your first book that just try stuff because nobody's watching. And in a way, that's kind of scary. But if nobody's watching, then why don't you just try stuff? Just put stuff out there and it won't, uh, you won't feel terrible. And I think the reason I get so scared about doing stuff like this is because I, it's difficult to forget that there are people there, like you guys, you're there. <laughs> so I think I feel differently about launches now because I've seen evidence that this works. And perhaps that this is how we'll end this evening because um, I might need a second gin and tonic. But this does work. And I know it can be hard 
to see it if you're at the beginning. Um, but basically, you can write books and make a living with your writing and multiple streams of income along the way. It is possible for you. And so when I look back on that first book, I'm going to get it right, Career Change, um, I just think how much things have changed in the last 10 years. Really, it's been 10 years for me. And um, yeah, by writing, by publishing, by putting yourself in the world in whatever way you like, by serving the community. And this, this community is amazing. I love you guys. I love the indie community. And, you know, by doing that consistently over time, you will be able to make a living writing if that's what you want. Or you will have your book in the world and you'll hold it in your hand and say, I made this. And that's the best feeling in the world, isn't it? So I think we're going to end there uh, with my rousing note. <laughs> so thank you all for coming this evening. And I really enjoyed it tonight. And I will definitely consider doing it again soon. Uh, so again, thank you. I will post this uh, on the blog soon and I will go into Facebook and type some responses to any comments that I might have missed. So um, yeah, if you want to check out the book, it's available in ebook, print, workbook, large print, multimedia course and soon to be audio book. Thanks for coming this evening and happy writing. <laughs>